to rake in more revenue from larger sections of the public. However, after revenue shortfalls from the e-levy, the minister announced a reintroduction of the tolls in the 2023 budget, which was read on Thursday, the 24th of November, 2022. Consequently, in his letter dated Friday the 10th of March, Mr. Ofariata, the finance minister, has given his ministry's input regarding the proposal on the fees and charges tabled for approval by the Roads Ministry, which means that if the Roads Ministry gives an approval, you'll be seeing shortly on your screens how much you would have to pay when you go to the tolls. Meanwhile, the roads minister, so that's just an idea. We'll go, we'll go into the details of how much uh, the various vehicles will be paying in the jiffy. Uh, meanwhile, the Ministry of Roads and Highways says the um, set reintroduction of the tolls applies to the Tema Motorway and its extension and, for instance, any other road that will be a public-private partnership project between a private institution and government uh, must be self-financed, hence the decision to toll such roads. The statement signed by the head of public affairs, uh, public relations at the ministry, Nasser Ahmed Yate, explained that the government has not reinstated tolls yet across the country. It says what the finance ministry put out was the public private partnership project which will be agreed on by the government and a private institution uh, to agree on which roads need to be told. So it is not just every road but then roads that will be a partnership between private institutions and government. So let's look at some of the, um, in terms of the amount you will be paying if you um, these new road tolls are implemented. Currently if you are a, a saloon vehicle, a regular four-wheel car, you pay 50 pesos. The new proposal is that you start paying one CD for um, private and smaller vehicles. Pickup of 4x4 vehicles used to pay one CD, now they'll pay one CD 50 pesos. Light buses like the urban buses and then also the civilian uh, buses which used to pay one CD would also be paying one CD 50 pesos. And then the mummy wagons would uh, be paying one CD uh, used to pay one city, would also now be paying one city 50 pesos. So, averagely, it's um, like a 50% increment on all the amounts that are going to be paid uh, for now. Uh, medium goods trucks, which used to pay two cities, are now going to be paying three cities. Heavy goods trucks, which used to pay two cities, are also going to be paying uh, three cities. And uh, those are the differences in the amounts. That will be paid and then the heavy goods trucks the ones that are really heavy and carry you know very huge items or what can basically refer to it as a heavy goods truck uh, which are four axles they used to pay two cities they are now going to be paying three cities and then the heavy goods truck those with five axles used to pay two city 50 pesos theirs is um uh, they're going to be paying three cities 50 pesos, that's like a one Ghana city extra. Now, heavy buses, um, like the STC size buses, used to pay one city 50 pesos. They're going to be paying two cities now. That's the proposed fee. And then the light goods truck, which have two axles, used to pay one city 50 pesos. It has been increased to two cities. Agricultural trucks or tractors, which pay 50 pesos, are now going to be paying one city and then a great tractor with a trailer, same amount. Proposal would be that they need to pay one city now. And then motorbikes would used to pay 10 pesos. That is why they almost always dodge and pass through these um, toll boots. Well, because of 10 pesos, now it's going to be 50 pesos. So they need to now slow down and make sure that they pay uh, as part of the revenue collection by the state. So at least you have idea of uh, how much you need to start preparing for to pay if uh, the roads ministry also gives its final approval to the proposal by the finance ministry regarding how much we start going to be paying uh, uh, with road tolls. Let's shift our attention to politics now because uh, many of you have been following and uh, here at uh, your election command center will give you the news when it becomes available. The latest Big story in the political front has to do with the former chairman of the Electoral Commission, Dr. Kujo Afarijan, who says or has criticized the commission for its move to discard the guarantor system for the continuous voter registration exercise. 
in a statement made exclusively to the uh, state uh, newspaper, the Daily Graphic, the uh, he said, that is Dr. Farijan said, that the contention of the EC, that the guarantor system was not robust and therefore the Ghana card should be the sole means of registration, was untenable. In his new critique, he said that he was not against the use of the Ghana card and did not also disagree with the EC, with the uh, Ghana card was of great importance and would go a long way to san sanitize the electoral role, according to him. And here's a quote attributed to him. He says, I think that um, it is grossly unfair and misleading to try to create the impression that the debate over whether or not as of now, the Ghana card should be the only basis for a Ghanaian citizen to be registered as a voter revolves wholly around who, uh, how useful the card is. I have not heard anybody saying that the Ghana card is not a good thing to have or use. In my view, as of now, it cannot be reasonably assumed that every Ghanaian of voting age has the Ghana card or can get one well ahead of the next elections. In fact, even that, um, in fact, given that even under continuous registration, there is a cut-off period during which time one can register as a voter but cannot vote in the following election, I think it is far too early yet to make a fetish of the Ghana card as the only basis for registration or registering a Ghanaian voter as a voter or Ghanaian as a voter. So it's a conversation that has been in uh, media circles for some time now. Let's uh, pick the thoughts of a uh, professor of political science at the University of Ghana, Professor Ransford Jampo. Prof, a very good afternoon to you. Thank you for joining us. Hi, good afternoon. Um, where do you stand on this debate? Uh, there is already a, a conversation about it in Parliament. The former ECJ has also waded into it. Some civil society bodies also think that the Electoral Commission's position that it should be just the Ghana card and uh, the scrapping the guarantor system is, um, you know, a very debatable issue. What's your take on it? Well, if you ask where I stand on this debate, it creates an impression that you yourself, you are not current and you are not up to date on the matter. If you are current and you are up to date on the matter, you see that it is for this same debate that Ken Atifa has taken serious issues with me, fighting me in the media eloquently and being defensive on matters that are um, challenging and staring in the face. I've been battling with him all over and on your own network, I've been there. My position on the matter is clear. And so you must rather uh, uh, appreciate what the current issues are. I side with um, Dr. Aparijan. I do not think that the Electoral Commission will have to be intransigent on this particular uh, matter. Um, its mandate relates to its stakeholders. And if stakeholders are not too comfortable with a certain uh, content of a CI and they feel that it will not inure to their benefit, um, and we have suspicion about the implementation of some content of the CI. The best way to go about it, in my view, is to sit them down and have an engagement um, with them just to be sure that the affairs uh, are laid. Once you're able to do that, I think you would have institutional peace to go about prosecuting your mandate. But um, um, if one has to hide um, his, his or her mandate over the need to build consensus in ensuring that there is peace, then it becomes problematic. You know, after Jan, I'm not surprised at what he said. He's a very experienced man. He taught political science for many years before he was appointed as a chair of the Electoral Commission. And if you witness any of his engagement with the political party, it was somebody who always had, had his foot on the pedal, he knew his staff and he could um, tell what would um, uh, bring about problem and what would bring about peace. He's a man who refused to implement the representation of the people's amendment law, even though parliament had passed it into law, simply because he felt that the political parties were not at idem, you know, on the implementation with that, of, of that particular um, law. When I was a member, I served as a member of the Electoral Reforms Committee 
we made a proposal that the principle of no verification, no vote should be upheld and should be implemented. When we submitted our report to Afghanistan, he said, yes, you may have agreed, but as far as he's concerned, um, he would not um, encourage the implementation of that NVNV because he felt that you can have an old chief who, for whatever reason, um, may have run into a prosecuted, uh, may have been a farmer for a long time, and because of that, none of the areas for verification may be working for him. We cannot look into the person's things and say that because of that, we are not going to allow you to register or to vote and all that. So he had a very proactive view of things, and he knew how to um, act in a manner that would not usher all of us in the, into a regime of robots. And all so right. I am very excited that he's also added his voice um, to this call, that the guarantor system, though others have abused it, must be used alongside the holding, uh, the, alongside the, uh, the, the Ghana card. And then okay. let us put in place, rather, mechanisms to ensure that those who are abusing and the guarantor system are, are reduced so that if we get to that point that we know that we've been able to um, register a critical mass of people, of Ghanaian voters, mm. who now reward them the Ghana card, then we can go that full hawk. So for me, there is no need to rush um, in abandoning the Ghana system okay. and in going solely for the Ghana card. If you rush too much, then it creates an impression, it deepens people's suspicion that maybe you have another agenda, and right. it doesn't other well for our peace. All right, thank you for your thought. Uh, Professor Ransford Jampo, uh, Professor of Political Science, University of Ghana, thank you for your thoughts as always. Uh, we're shifting to some other stories now, and uh, former presidential staffer Charles Bissu is asking an Accra High Court to stop the office of the special prosecutor from prosecuting him because he was set free by the Ghana police in investigations relating to Galamse activities. Charles Bissu is in court over bribery allegations following an undercover investigation by journalist Anas Arumeyao Anas. Bissu had um, amended his case at, uh, to add that if the OSP or the Office of the Special Prosecutor wants to prosecute him, then it must add the undercover journalist Anas since his company offered him the alleged bribe. Charles BCU had filed an application on December 23 last year and subsequently amended the application on 4th January 2023 to restrain the OSP from investigating and prosecuting him over allegations made by Anas Arimeo Anas in a purported corruption documentary, Galamse Fraud, uh, which was published in February of 2019. Her Ladyship Justice Olivia Obengo Wusu, while granting the request ordered the Office of the Special Prosecutor to file that statement of case within two weeks, which would elapse on the 27th of March. So it's a conversation that uh, we'll be keeping very close eye on for you and see how it plays out in court. And um, still on Media Live, though, let's uh, move away from the courts and go to education. Now, the Minister for Education, Dr. Yao Ose Educhum has said that the education sector is vehemently being revolutionized to ensure students are trained to meet demands in the job market. A lead advisor to the ministry, Dr. Charles Yaboa, had earlier expressed worry about the kind of programs being offered in the various universities which, to him, do not prepare graduates for the job market. William Evans Inkum has come through with the following report. Institutions across the country churn out thousands of students every year. Pathetically few meet the job market. A lead advisor to the Ministry of Education, Dr. Charles Yabua, has been explaining why. Universities today are not adequately preparing graduates for the world of work and therefore contribute to the huge skills and competences gap between schools and industry. For many years, companies in all sectors of the economy here in Ghana and abroad have complained that today's graduates lack basic certain skills and competencies for the modern workplace. So, in all this, what is the position of the Ministry of Education? Uh, the ecosystem 
has been created. Now at a point where TVET has become more relevant to the needs of our nation, and I know you're talking about the fourth industrial revolution and the fact that certain jobs are going to be lost. And, and therefore, we need to be shifting gears into the new TVET space. And that is why under the new TV, in the new TVET space, students are taking courses in math, uh, science, English. You really have to train the new kind of TVET expert or uh, somebody with TVET expertise who is well-rounded. What do you want to be remembered for in the next few years? Let me say three years to come. Uh, th this guy has uh, set me up. <laughs> uh, remembered for uh, leading the president's agenda for STEM and TV transformation. Uh, I believe that we have come to a re recognition and realization that the TV of yesteryears will not change Ghana. We have the need the 21st century TV. William Evans Simkum, TV3 News, Kumase. Right, we're saying on issues of education and the many angles that have, you know, come up as a result of that. Executive Director of the Institute for Education Studies, IFEST, Dr. Peter uh, Pate Anti, has joined us via Zoom for a quick conversation on this. Doc, a very good afternoon to you. Thank you for joining us. Good afternoon. I'm sure you've been following the Education Minister's uh, position, and I mean, Specifically, he's saying that one thing he would like to be remembered for will be uh, the STEM that this government is championing. From where you sit, right from the basics through secondary, maybe we can talk to Sherry later, how much of an improvement has Ghana made when it comes to STEM education and, uh, you know, government's decision to reinvest and make sure that we have a strong system when it comes to science, technology, engineering and mathematics? Well, I think that um, when we talk about STEM, we, we take our minds back to the late um, 20, the late 1990s, where we started uh, equipping our various um, science um, um, labs. I remember those science resource centers with their buses that used to carry students from one school to the other the to have their science practice. Yellow buses, yes, that to have their science practicals. So those were the periods that um, a lot of um, investment and interest were were put in in that particular sector. But I must say that uh, from the time the minister took over as the minister of education, he's shown commitment to improving science, technology, engineering, and mathematics education. And as 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 we are talking now, we are having schools that are specifically dedicated to STEM education. Um, I'm very much aware that a STEM curriculum has been developed. Um, I know that he's also championing issues relating to engineering and, and helping students assess um, um, engineering in some of our uh, local universities. I know that he's also ma making headway when it comes to allowing students who, do, who did not pursue um, any science-related course to still do engineering at the, at, the, at the tertiary level. So you go to UMAT, you go to, I think, Pentecost University, there are pre-tertiary um, um, uh, uh, programs or one year tertiary program that is designed for students who did the arts and still have the field, the, the, the zeal to do uh, engineering. And these are things that he's championing. And, and therefore, if he says that he wants to be remembered for that, I, I, I think that he is doing a lot much more in that area. Mm. Some of us have said that instead of starting uh, new institutions, uh, the, there's a need to invest in the already existing ones. I'm told and that these are things that he has also um, shown commitment to, that in some of our secondary schools, they are expanding their, uh, their science labs and they are also doing uh, other, uh, making sure that some of these resources are provided for schools that are already classified as science schools. But mm. of course, and then the, the, the other thing that uh, I have to also uh, commend him is the um, the idea of virtual labs. I, I've spoken about virtual virtual labs on several platforms, and and I'm told that these are things that they are also some of the schools are also adopting. That instead of um, putting in physical infrastructure, they are resorting to virtual labs to mix uh, to to do laboratory experiments that would have taken them 
to do using physical uh, uh, or chemical uh, 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 materials. Okay. So, so okay. these are things that he's doing. You look okay. at Tibet, you can see that there's a renewed effort in Tibet. You know those days when you were doing technical skills at the senior at the junior high school level. We, right. we used to learn how to lay bricks and do all those things. Yeah. Now you can see that there's a lot of commitment, a lot more commitment into Tibet education, which even the, the beginning or the establishment of the Tibet services that is supposed to take care of uh, Tibet. So I, I have to say, frankly, yeah. that a lot of work has gone into both the STEM issues and right. TVET. Right. And, and talking about TVET, uh, the uh, education minister again has in recent times uh, been making comments regarding TVET and, um, you know, senior high schools where he has challenged the heads of these institutions that if they do not improve, especially those that are always getting between 0 and 10 percent pass rate, there is a likelihood that they may be shut down. That comment came and has been met with mixed reactions. I'm sure you uh, have heard that as well. What do you make of it? Time to improve yeah, them or that. maybe they need to be shut down like the minister is suggesting? I, I've heard that. I've read that from the ministry's website, uh, Facebook page. I, I've had several certain explanations coming from, the, the, from my people at the ministry trying to indicate that the reportage is a little bit skewed. But it's clear in the reports that they put on their Facebook page, unless, of course, it's pulled down, that the minister was asked, saying that if some schools continue to perform below 10%, there would not be any option than to close them down. I need to state that um, if you look at school closures based on per low performance, it's happened in the United States. So I'm not surprised that the minister is talking about it because you know, we know that that is where he had most of his um, educational orientation. And in the United States, between 2006 and 2013, a lot of schools were closed down uh, in 26 states in the, in the United States of America. Now, a study was carried out and published in 2017 that sought to look at the effect of the school closures on, 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 on the, um, the, 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 the establishment. And it was clear, indicated that, it was clearly indicated that the schools that were, the, the students that were sent to the schools um, after the low performing schools were closed down, after they got to their final year, their performance were as worse as they were when they were in the uh, schools that were classified as low performance. What am I trying to say? I'm saying that when it comes to performance of students, there are a lot of variables that play critical roles in that. And you cannot single out the headmaster or the head of the institution as the as the person solely responsible for the low performance of the school we also need to ask ourselves are we giving the, the students i mean the schools the needed resources are we giving them the needed teachers the needed textbooks the infrastructure that they are studying in? how is it like if you are able to check all these things and we still feel that despite the provision of all these variables the the students are still not doing well i would still go forward and ask why don't we change the head? Because the minister is on record to have said that there was an assistant master of Presec who was moved to another school. Mm. And after I, the, the master was moved to that school. The, the school has seen some tremendous change and transformation. Right. So changing the heads of the institution can lead to changing the future, I mean, the performance of that particular mm -hmm. school. Okay. But closing the schools empirically seems not to be an option that we can we can we can resort to at this time because the evidence is clear that okay. at the end of the day the end result will not be any different from what it was already right right certainly sir, it's one of the subjects that many people have expressed interest in but i'm sure we'll be engaging you further to see how best we can revive these schools that are performing under uh 10 thank you very much uh, dr peter pate anti executive director of ifest you're still watching uh midday live on tv3 Let's uh, take a look at some other pressing stories we have for you this afternoon. Now, the family of the 27-year-old man who was shot dead by Upper West Regional Police Anti-Robbery Unit is demanding an immediate uh, independent committee to investigate the incident. They contend that the deceased was not an armed robber and uh, demand that the police acknowledge their error and compensate the family for unjustifiably killing their son. The family of Abubakar Shahid, who was shot dead in war by the Upper West Regional Police Anti-Robbery Unit on Thursday, March 9, is still in grief. <laughs> they refused to accept the assertion by the Regional Police Command that their son was an armed robber. 
The deceased was reportedly on his way to his employer, but was shot dead by the police. A brother of a deceased, Isa Isahaku, reportedly collapsed and died when news about his brother's death was announced. One would have thought that under standard policing procedures, resort to the use of arms would never be the first option. However, it becomes evident that our men in uniform are becoming trigger happy. All right, so let's um, speak to some family members of this gentleman and find out from them what exactly their current position is. Um, we've been joined by Mohamed Tamin, who is the spokesperson of the bereaved family. Mr. Tamin, a very good afternoon to you. Thank you for joining us on Midday Live. Good afternoon, my brother. What has been the reaction of the IGP or the police service so far to this case? Well... The IGP, he called the family this morning and he spoke as a leader like he is to try that to restore calm and peace within the Upper West while the investigation continues. So we held a press conference yesterday and we gave them 24 hours ultimately to either respond or we embark on the second phase of our crusade. That is justice for Shahid. But so, fortunately, the IGP called today. Mm. He spoke with some family members because I was the one he called. But then we were still in the family meeting arranging to do the next stage of our morning. Then the information got to them that this is what the IGP said. And they were all happy that the IGP is out to send an independent body to probe into the issue. So you mean the IGP has uh, spoken to the family and has confirmed that he or the police service will set up an independent investigator to look into the case? Yes, please. Okay. And so what's the, fa the family's reaction to that call from the IGP? And uh, are you well, willing to cooperate? Well, we are willing to cooperate. No one is above the law. Unless they are trying to escape from the, rush, the fact that we were going to the next phase of our issue. That is, we wanted to do a demonstration today. Tomorrow, we could have petitioned a strike, the Parliament House, over the issue. But thank God he has called. We'll be giving him another day to see how his investigation, although it won't be that public, we'll see how they will reach the family. Mm. All right. Um, Mohamed Tamin, we are grateful that uh, you made time to speak to us. Uh, we'll certainly be following up to see uh, what next. You say in 24 hours you are waiting to see what action will follow the call of the IGP. Is that it? Yes, please. Okay. So definitely we'll also be following up to see what happens next. Thank you so much for making time to speak to us. Mohamed Tamin is the spokesperson of the family of the young man who was uh, killed by the anti-robbery squad of the Ghana Police Service. They say he wasn't an armed robber. And um, following that, the IGP has reached out to the family. It's an unfolding story. Trust us to keep you posted subsequently. We're staying in the northern part of the country. This time around, we are talking about the vaccines and the distribution thereon. So uh, health facilities in northern Ghana, we are told, have also taken delivery of their vaccines. Some health facilities in that part of the country began administering it to the children um, when they got their uh, allocations. And uh, some have also stopped, stored it in their medical uh, cold rooms. A visit to some health facilities in Tamale, specifically the sub-metro, saw parents waiting for the vaccines to be administered uh, to their children. Two days now since the vaccines arrived here in the northern region. Now, according to the regional health director, Dr. Brahma Abubakari, 10 districts out of the 16 districts in the northern region have so far taken delivery of the vaccines. Now, most health facilities in the Tamale metropolis are yet to take delivery of their consignments. I have visited most of these hospitals and nurses there tell me that even though the vaccines have been allocated to the various health directories, they are yet to also take delivery of their consignment. 
parents who have brought their children in anticipation of getting a job are still waiting. So when I came, I went and asked one of the midwives and they said um, it has come but it has not reached the hospital yet. So I'm still waiting for it. The day that they, they told us that they didn't bring it, we, we were not happy. But now that we are so happy to get it to our children. At the central hospital in the Tamale metropolis, and as can be seen in the background, the vaccines have arrived at the facility and they are administering the vaccines to the uh, children. Parents tell me that they are very happy that the vaccines have arrived and they are commending government for this effort and they hope that within the next six weeks when these consignment would have been exhausted more will come for them to benefit from right so from the northern region let's come to the greater Accra region where there is mad rush for childhood vaccines at various health facilities in Accra since the onset of the distribution. Most mothers have expressed relief after months of waiting. Let's um, connect to Judith Awachitanda, who has been visiting the Osu and Mamprobi polyclinics and has joined us via Zoom for a quick chat. Judith, good afternoon. What else can you report? Right. Um, I'm currently at the Mamprobi polyclinic. Of course, there were a lot of women here since the morning receiving their vaccines they are very happy that finally the fight is over most of them have been waiting for two to three months trying to get vaccines for their children uh, to no avail but since the vaccines arrived they have received a, a sigh of relief they're able to get these vaccines a lot of mothers have been trooping in and out of the hospital currently um, the mothers have reduced here but earlier in the day there were so many mothers here uh, also at the other hospital which i visited for that place it was just filled with so many mothers as it was to maternity home it was packed to the brim so many mothers were there uh, receiving their jobs some had uh, just given birth about two weeks ago and for them although they didn't uh, they hadn't been waiting for months they were scared that if the vaccines don't arrive uh, as soon as possible their children might fall sick uh, or get any of the diseases that these vaccines were supposed to cure and so definitely um, these women have uh, heaved a sigh of relief they believe that their children are now safe and they of course they're happy that these vaccines have arrived all right, Judith, thank you very much. We know that subsequent bulletins, you'll bring us further updates of the distribution and on what administering of these vaccines to children across the country. Just to watch it live on TV3, let's go to some other stories uh, now. And then the Ascent Central Member of Parliament and the 2024 presidential hopeful for the New Patriotic Party, Kennedy Japong, has taken on the Ghana Revenue Authority over what he describes as harassment. The NPP firebrand in an interview described the Revenue Authority's decision to audit a yet-to-be-completed steel company as witch hunt because of his political ambition. Let's listen to him. Tamisia, Mingwe, about 65% complete. You know. Ghana revenue, a true letter said they want to go and audit me. And then they went there. I don't know what they're going to do. Me a Ghana, I'm a businessman. Omon Tiasi, a cross a Ghana, who a guinea say, a beer juma, a ma, Nimia Ghana, any pummy and sat from Ghana revenue authority. Echo the ticket in Japan. So basically, uh, Kenny Japon is saying that uh, his steel factory that he's constructing is about 65% complete. And even now that it's not completed, the Ghana Revenue Authority have reached out to him saying they want to go and audit it. In fact, three persons from the uh, Revenue Authority have already been to his uh, site all in the name of auditing to find out, uh, you know, how far he has done and then probably the financing of the whole project, which he believes is harassment and intimidation. Those were his words and more like uh, just giving an interpretation of what he said in the local language of tree that's in English.
Now, the Ghana Revenue Authority's management, however, has refuted these allegations of uh, constant harassment by the Member of Parliament for Asin Central Kennedy in Japan through unwarranted audits of his company. The authority has also been compelled to issue a statement after the MP who is aspiring to be the presidential candidate of the New Patriotic Party claimed his presidential ambition has brought unwarranted uh, attention from the tax outfit onto him. In the statement, the GRA insisted its officials are merely carrying out their mandate. The statement stressed that the MP's company was not singled out for the regular exercise and says about 30 uh, of such risk-based activities were carried out on a number of businesses in January and February of this year, 2023. So uh, it looks as though it's a back and forth between the firebrand politician and the state institution, the Ghana Revenue Authority. You're still watching Midday Live and uh, we have many more stories for you right after this. Stay with us. Well, Parkwisi has joined us in studio for the latest in the world of business, and uh, he's going to take it right away. Parkwisi, good afternoon. Hi, Martin. Good afternoon. How are you doing? Right, not bad at all. So, yeah. take it away. What's in business? Thank you. I heard you speak some English. You said, well, what the? What's that? <laughs> <laughs> What's the Chris Waddle you're talking uh, about? Uh, let's give us business. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, and welcome to the business news segment here on Midday Live. Uh, we begin with happenings at the Finance Ministry, and three business sources at the Finance Ministry have revealed that payments processes have commenced for bonds that matured during the domestic debt exchange program but were not honored. Well, the officials said holders of the bonds could be receiving their monies by close of day to day uh, through to Wednesday. The government suspended debt service during the exchange exercise and pledged to resume payments by March 13, uh, following a meeting with all three bondholder groups that refused to participate in the debt restructuring. But as of close of day Monday, the government had again not honored its promise, raising concerns among bondholders. The delay angered the three bondholder groups who have vowed to resume their protest if the payments delay further. The payments, if executed today, will bring relief to the bondholders who have become anxious. We'll keep an eye on this uh, latest development and bring you updates as and when. Meanwhile, the Pension of Bondholders Forum is unhappy with the government's delay in resuming, resuming coupon and principal payments on matured bonds. Convener of the Pension of Forum, Dr. Arani Entry, said its members whose bonds mature during the period are yet to be paid. He spoke to three business. We didn't expect uh, a situation like this after government has uh, promised that it is going to resume the payment of coupons and uh, maturities. That is worrying for the issuer not to tell the bondholders anything, not to give any information whatsoever. That is something that we shouldn't uh, allow to be happening. If the promise has been made, the promise must be kept uh, to make sure that the public will have confidence In other news, financial analyst with Dalex Finance, Joe Jackson, is warning of dire consequences for Ghana's economy if government fails to secure an IMF program by middle of next month. His warning follows earlier remarks by Finance Minister Ken Oferata that things could get out of hand if a bailout program is not reached by the end of April. Speaking in an interview on Business Focus, Joe Jackson said, based on the ongoing negotiations with external creditors and China's lukewarm attitude, the process could be much more protracted. Well, the, the, the dark consequences will start with a shortage of foreign exchange. This is a country that imports all its energy requirements. Maybe uh, so fuel, we could run out of fuel. We could run out of electricity because uh, 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 less than 30% uh, of that is generated from Akosombo. We could run out of drugs, food. Everything imported would be at risk. 
Remember that we haven't paid a dime in our uh, foreign exchange debts since December. We've defaulted. The reason why we have been treated with kid gloves so far is because there's reasonable belief that the IMF deal will happen soon enough and there will be stabilization in our affairs, our economic affairs. If we miss this deadline and we miss it too badly, that belief could disappear and we could start to face the doomsday scenario that His Excellency the President of Ghana has described. Well, that's all for the business news segment here on Midday Live. My name is Park Kusiasari. Uh, for more business news stories, do well to log on to our website. It's www.3news.com. Oreku Ampo for a standing by with the very latest in the world of sports. Music stars like Ms. V, Kwame Eugene, Kelvin Boy, Mr. Drew, Enno Baroni, Jackie, and many more. Make a date with us on Wednesday, 15th of March, 2023 at 12 noon as we get to find out the list of artists shortlisted for the 10th anniversary of the VGMA and SAG category. This announcement will be live on selected media general platforms. The 24th VGMA and SAG is a charter house initiative with partnership from 3 Entertainment and sponsored by Close Up Complete Fresh Protection. that one bounces some more stories in commemoration and commemorating the women history month the u.s embassy the goethe institute and alias francais in accra have jointly held a film festival to honor and celebrate the achievements of women in television and film here are some details the Women in Motion Film Festival, Eight Nights of Films, started on March 8, 2023 in Accra to scream films for, about and by women. Hosted by the United States Embassy, Alliance Francaise and the Gothe Institute's Ghana, the film festival and panel discussions was held to commemorate the International Women's Day and Women's History Month. So we really looked at sort of what the catalogue uh, films offered and thought about what films would resonate with women here as well as in our own country. So we looked at themes, everything from economic independence, migration, motherhood, political independence. And yeah, so these were all themes that we thought really complemented each other well and explored different facets of what it means to be a woman today. Short films including Madame's Cravings and The Consequences of Feminism by Alice Guy from the reports of the security guards and patrol services part one by Helg Sander from Germany and Black Barbie by Ghanaian British filmmaker Comfort Arthur was screened on day one of the festival. Director of the Gothe Institute, Helg Frizel, said the initiative is to inspire women to work harder to achieve greatness. I mean, if you if you see the numbers, for example, in Germany, like in the banks, in the in the uh, boards of banks, it's 10 percent women, or in the big uh, in the big uh, companies, it's like 10 to 15 maybe percent women, and all the other are men still. In the parliament in Germany, a third part of them are women, but in the population, it's 50 percent. So we, sh we have to change that, I think, and we have to acknowledge and to admit that women are the half of, the, of humankind and uh, they should be also be active in all the important things. Well, that's how we wrap up on entertainment here on Midday Live. My name is Noella. There's more after this. At least 99 people have died in Malawi after tropical storm Freddy ripped through southern Africa for the second time in a month. Terrifying amounts of brown water have cascaded through neighborhoods, sweeping away homes. Malawi's biggest city, Blantyre, has recorded the most deaths, 85 including 36 in a landslide. The government has declared a state of disaster in 10 districts that have been hardest hit by the storm. Rescue workers are overwhelmed and are using shovels to try to find survivors buried in the mud. 
And that's how we bring the bulletin to a close. Thank you very much for spending the last hour with us. My name is Martin Asiedu Date. Our website, 3 newscom with many more stories for you. Have a good afternoon and as always, stay positive. Bye for now.